Uh, thank you, Ashok, and thank you, everybody, uh, uh, for, for coming to hear what I'm going to tell you. And thanks to organizers for giving us the opportunity to tell people about this unpublished work. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about uh, some work that a couple of my grad students are working on, on understanding how much do cells know about their extracellular environment, right? So, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, just to, to acknowledge the people who did the work, this was done by uh, two of my grad students, Hoda Akl and Andrew Getz, and our work is funded by the NIGMS. So many of you may know that signaling networks are uh, chemical reaction networks that allow cells to interpret their environment. So this is an example of uh, tumor cells uh, sensing the concentration of uh, a growth factor, EGF, and as a result, uh, going from the tumor to the blood vessel. And this is obviously an important process because this is one of the steps in metastasis. Now, if I look at what's happening at the cell level when the cells are sensing this extracellular signal, in this case, the EGF, what I'll see is uh, a fairly complicated a signaling network. So what's happening here is uh, there are some receptors for this ligand molecule EGF. The EGF binds to these receptors and a whole bunch of downstream signaling happens. Molecules get modified, they get phosphorylated, and these uh, chemical modifications are then interpreted by the cells and actions are taken as a result. A surprising finding, which we know now for maybe 20, 30 years, is that when cells even if they are genetically identical, when cells are exposed to the same environmental stimuli, uh, the response in individual cells can differ substantially. So here I'm showing you the distribution of uh, uh, the distribution of oops, sorry, the distribution of EGF receptor levels uh, at steady state when cells were exposed with different amount of EGF. Uh, on the x-axis, I've plotted the EGF concentration in the environment and the y-axis is the steady state amount of EGF. And uh, the two distributions that you're seeing are EGF levels, uh, EG EGF receptor levels uh, at two different ligand concentrations. And you can see that even though the ligand concentrations here vary by a factor of 30, uh, the, the distributions uh, or single cell responses uh, can be, uh, can have a large overlap. And this is not just true at the receptor level. Let's say if I look at what's happening uh, downstream to some phosphorylation of some downstream component, here too I see that the phosphorylation response uh, of a, a downstream protein following EGF receptor uh, uh, binding to EGF can be can vary uh, uh, quite substantially, even though the ligand concentrations are quite different. I can go further down. Now I'm looking at uh, nuclear localization of a transcription factor FOXO, again, uh, in response to cells being stimulated with, in this case, insulin-like growth factor or IGF. And the story is the same. The distribution of, uh, of single cell responses is significantly wide. And as a result, uh, uh, even though the, the cells are identical, uh, what individual cell will do in response to an extracellular stimulus uh, is uh, is quite different uh, compared to any other cell in the population. Uh, a way to quantify how different are individual cells' responses to the extracellular medium, uh, to the changes in the extracellular medium, is mutual information. It's a, it's a concept from information theory developed uh, around 70, 80 years ago now. And the idea here is that, let's say, if I think of some input, uh, let's denote it by U, and it could be something like a concentration of an extracellular ligand. I'm, I'm going to think of an output. In this case, it could be uh, the nuclear amount of some transcription factor or phosphorylated level of some protein or the receptor levels and so on. And I'm going to think of, uh, in a cell population, what is the probability of observing the output? In this case, let's say the, the nuclear uh, nuclear uh, abundance of any particular transcription factor as a function of the input, right? And the, and the distributions that I've shown you here are basically the histograms of this probability distribution. One can quantify uh, how much 
the how much information is there in this output uh, about the the input that the cell is receiving uh, using this quantity called mutual information, which you can think of as a way of uh, quantifying whether the distribution over outputs uh, depends on the distribution over inputs or not. Right. So the mutual information uh, is a positive number. Uh, sorry, it's a positive number. Uh, if it's zero, it means that the output was completely independent of the input and there is no information, roughly saying that the cell or that output doesn't really have any information about the input. Uh, this mutual information depends on the distribution of environmental inputs. Uh, you can think of these environmental input distribution as maybe uh, the way, let's say, a particular ligand fluctuates in your bloodstream, its concentration fluctuates in your bloodstream. Uh, this is a quantity that's typically not accessible experimentally, uh, but one can think of uh, the maximum value of this mutual information over all possible input distributions. And that's typically called a channel capacity, which is a maximum of the mutual information uh, as a function of the input distribution. And what this channel capacity is telling us is what is the maximum amount of information that is contained in this output, uh, in our case, let's say the abundance of some transcription factor as a function of the input. And it's obviously an important quantity. This tells me, quote unquote, how much does the output know about what's happening to the input? Now, if uh, if the response, let's say P of X given U, uh, varies, uh, sorry, uh, overlaps substantially between uh, across different inputs, uh, as is shown in uh, in the in the figure on the left, it means that uh, it potentially means that the the output doesn't really know much about what's happening to the input. Uh, there's going to be a lot of confusion, and the channel capacity slash mutual information will be low. Uh, this mutual information has been computed uh, for many many signaling networks, uh, especially in the mammalian context. And it's always found out that uh, across many, many examples, the mutual information is quite low. So this was uh, maybe the first paper to calculate mutual information for, uh, again, translocation of a different transcription factor in response to some extracellular ligand, the channel capacity, the maximum of the mutual information was found out to be around one bit. Uh, same for another transcription factor, the mutual information was something like one and a half bits. Uh, people have also looked at uh, 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 these kinds of systems uh, in yeast cells uh, under using optogenetics. And again, mutual information turns out to be uh, something that is quite low. And one way to interpret a number like one bit is to say that if there are multiple inputs available in the environment, the signaling network can only discern between two inputs. Basically, in some sense, the signaling network can detect whether the input is present or whether the input is absent. It doesn't really know uh, the gradation uh, uh, between uh, a very low input and a very low output. It's not able to detect the concentration of the input. It's only able to detect whether the input is present or not. Uh, this is somewhat surprising because these signaling networks do appear to be somewhat tuned and cells do perform functions as a function of the input concentration. Uh, and so we wanted to understand uh, how come uh, these uh, channel capacities are, are evaluated to be so low. So in order to understand uh, what gives rise to cell-to-cell -cell variability, which in turn is reflected in the mutual information or channel capacity, let's look at, let's take a step back and look at what are the contributors to the observed cell-to-cell -cell variability. So here I'm showing you uh, the plot of, uh, again, this nuclear uh, abundance of this particular transcription factor uh, when uh, cells were stimulated with uh, insulin-like growth factor. Uh, individual uh, lines or the squiggly lines represent individual cells. Uh, the black line represents the population average. Uh, and th this experiment is kind of done over like 50, 60 different cells. And looking at this graph, you already kind of have guessed perhaps uh, what are the two uh, sources of variability uh, when I look at a cell population. So the cell-to-cell -cell variability arises because of two things, largely speaking. There is stochastic fluctuations in the biochemical reaction networks, 
uh, biochemical reaction networks uh, are uh, are again the, the, the chemical reaction networks where molecules are binding to each other they are phosphorylating each other and so on but the number of molecules typically uh, is not molar quantities but maybe of the order of hundreds or to thousands and these are inherently random processes and as a result uh, the time evolution of these chemical reaction networks is not deterministic and that gives rise to some some variability and this is yeah again this is because the the small numbers and uh, the noise that is related to small numbers and this obviously inherently corrupts uh, the information transduction between the input and the output so if your if your signaling network uh, whose output is a read off of what's happening to the input if the read off is probabilistic uh, you clearly have lost information about what's happening to the input now there is another source of variability uh, which is the variability in cell state variables uh, and this variability uh, oh sorry uh, I, I had forgot to remove this uh, this slide this variability basically arises because of a uh, very large uh, uh, arises because of differences in abundance levels of different proteins across cells uh, and it's not inherently corruptive but it's often much larger than stochastic fluctuations and we can look at it uh, a bit more uh, if we think about it uh, mathematically. Uh, if I have uh, uh, if I have let's say a population of cells where uh, different cells are behaving differently, and if I have, let's say have this kind of a time course, I can try to understand these two sources of variability uh, by looking at this graph. Uh, again, let's think of an input uh, which is going to be a ligand concentration, and output in our case is this. Uh, abundance of this uh, transcription factor. And let's think of uh, cell-specific biochemical parameters, and let's call them cell state variables. And these could be uh, the, the number of receptors on the cell surface, uh, the different reaction rates, and these uh, parameters could differ from cell to cell. Then the distribution that we observe in a population of the output is basically the distribution that one may observe at the single cell level which is going to be governed by the parameters of that cell averaged over the population of uh, over the cell population which is an average over these cell parameters right so typically in an experiment we are going to observe this uh, distribution that is averaged over these cell state variables uh, the distribution that's given in red here is basically what i was talking about earlier which is uh, when these chemical reaction networks are stochastic uh, the distribution at a single cell level uh, is governed by uh, the inherent randomness of these stochastic chemical networks. And one, if you have, let's say, some reasonable model uh, of how these reactions are happening, you can get a rough idea of how this distribution looks like. And this may not be experimentally accessible because uh, typically when you perturb cells, uh, let's say with a growth factor or something, they start growing. So it's not the same, same cell again. And so you can't get to this distribution by repeatedly perturbing a cell. Uh, but if you know a model, you may be able to uh, get a good guess of what this distribution looks like. And finally, you want to know what is the distribution of these cell state variables uh, across a cell population. And typically, it's going to be very difficult to get to this quantity because it's a kind of ill-defined, uh, ill-posed inverse problem. Uh, we have previously developed some methods to do this, and I'm not going to talk about how to do that. But I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy to uh, discuss this uh, offline further. Uh, but in general, you can think of the observed cell-to-cell -cell variability uh, in a population as arising from these two factors. One is the stochastic noise, which occurs at the level of a single cell. Uh, and on top of that, there is this uh, variability in cell state variables uh, that's uh, uh, in, in, a, in a cell population. And what you're observing is actually uh, kind of a sum over both these factors. Now, you can, you can look at this mathematical idealization and see perhaps uh, how, to, how to disentangle these, these two effects in the, in, the, in the graph that I'm showing. So, oh, sorry, in the graph that I'm showing, uh, if you look at a single cell and you see these squiggly lines at the single cell level, so the variability that you're seeing, let's say, around some steady state that is that is reached here, 
uh, is basically the variability that's arising because of these stochastic fluctuations. At the same time, the variability that you're seeing across different cells, uh, where some cells are able to remove this uh, transcription factor from the nucleus, while other cells are not able to remove this transcription factor across nucleus, uh, this variability is arising because of the variability in cell state variables. And you can already see that the variability in cell state variables is much larger compared to the stochastic uh, fluctuations that happen at the single cell level. And this turns out to be the case for most signaling networks in mammalian cells, in, in single cell organisms, and, and uh, almost uh, most signaling networks that have been studied. It turns out that the cell state variability is a dominant contributor to uh, cell to cell variability. So you want to basically be able to remove the effect of this cell state variability. Uh, so let's let's see what this cell state variability does uh, when we think about information transduction at the population level. So imagine I have a whole bunch of cells and all of them have different cell state variables. Uh, and imagine that I hit these cells with some low signal, let's say low concentration of a ligand, and I see a population level response. And let's say, imagine I hit the same cells uh, with a high signal and I see some other population level response. The response is obviously moved, but there's a significant overlap at the population level. And what this would mean then is that these cells kind of don't really know what's happening uh, in the extracellular environment because the response of the cells are quite, uh, uh, are quite overlapping. So if you just look at the, the population level response, you may, you may conclude that the mutual information between this output and the input is low. But now if I look at what's happening at the single cell level, it may be the case that even though the population level responses are significantly overlapping, if I look at the response distribution at the single cell level, these distributions are gonna be quite narrowly distributed. And uh, as a result, it may be the case that single cells are able to detect what's happening in their environment, even though a cell state average response will lead you to believe that the mutual information between the input and the output is low. So how do I uh, take this kind of observation and make it uh, mathematically concrete? Right? So we have to come up with a new way of calculating information uh, when different agents or different cells in your population are slightly different from each other. So uh, because I can't see what's happening uh, next. So th the question we are, now faced with is that how do I quantify information transduction when different cells act like different channels? So they have different dynamical variables. Uh, this uh, quantity has already been uh, uh, defined in a slightly different context in information theory and it's called the conditional mutual information. And the idea here is that, uh, let's say, let's imagine the standard way of thinking of mutual information. I have some cells, I expose them to some signals, I look at the population level response and I calculate the mutual information between the input and the output. I can do the same exercise at the single cell level. I can look at a single cell. I can look at its response when its cell state variables are fixed. And I can calculate the mutual information between the input and the output at the single cell level. And when I have a population, I take the average of this single cell mutual information at the population level. And this is called the conditional mutual information. It turns out, I'm sorry, the conditional mutual information is always greater than the mutual information. Kind of suggesting that if we only make the assumption that individual cells in a population are different, the amount of information about the input that's carried at the level of single cell level is guaranteed to be larger than when you look at the population. It already tells you that maybe the single cells know much more than what population level uh, analysis may indicate. So we looked at the EGF, uh, sorry, the IGF uh, FOXO pathway uh, to study information transfer at the single cell level. Just a very brief uh, idea of how this pathway works. Uh, you have receptors for IGF, which is insulin-like growth factor on the cell surface. You add IGF to the environment of the cells. Uh, it binds to the receptors, IGF phosphorylates AKT, which is a downstream uh, uh, molecule. And AKT basically pulls off this uh, uh, transcription factor FOXO from the nucleus. So what's going to happen is that when I add IGF to the environment, 
AKT gets phosphorylated and FOXO is removed from the cells, uh, from the nucleus. So uh, you're going to see a drop in FOXO levels as a function of time. And you can see that in this video, uh, at time t equal to zero, uh, there's brightness at the center of the cells, which is basically the nucleus. You add IGF and the brightness in the nucleus goes away and it goes into the cytoplasm. This is basically suggesting or showing that when you add IGF to the environment, FOXO runs away from the nucleus. And with this particular system, we can actually follow uh, individual cells over time uh, as, a, as a function of uh, uh, individual cells over time. So we have access to the stochastic variability at the single cell level as well. So now we have this single cell data. We have a reasonable model. Now what we need to do is to get a distribution over the parameters uh, of the population or these cell state variables. Again, this is something, it's a quite non-trivial problem, which we have solved previously. Uh, and the idea is that we find a maximum entropy distribution over these parameters that is consistent with the data and the model. And I'm happy to discuss this further uh, over email or, or offline. So now we have all the components to calculate mutual information at the single cell level. And when we do that, we actually find something quite surprising. So here I'm plotting uh, the, the maximum of the mutual information as a function of time uh, after the ligand was added. Uh, the, what I'm showing here right now is the mutual information calculated the standard way where I'm looking at the response of the population as a function of the ligand concentration and I'm finding a distribution over ligand concentrations that maximizes that response. So on the left hand side, I'm showing you the mutual information. On the right hand side, I'm showing you uh, the the input distribution that corresponds to the maximum of the mutual information. And as you can see, the mutual information is roughly one bit, as was seen in many other signaling networks. And the corresponding input distribution is bimodal. It's basically trying to detect a very low input and a very high input. Uh, this was just showing that the model that we fit to this data also gives us the same mutual information. Uh, this is just a consistency check for us. Uh, that our model kind of agrees with the data. But now I can look at the mutual information calculated at the single cell level, the conditional mutual information. Now, when I look at the conditional mutual information, it's significantly higher than the mutual information that's, that's estimated using population average response. Uh, and this number is an average over all cells in the population. Some cells are very good at sensing what's happening in the environment. Some cells are very bad. And I can look at the distribution of cells uh, in terms of their mutual information or their performance. Uh, the, the dark shaded uh, region is uh, cells which are within 90 per, within 50% uh, of this average uh, population average and the, the, the faint shaded region are cells within 90% of the population average. And what this basically shows you that at individual cell level, uh, cells or the in the output at individual cell level knows quite more, quite much more compared to what you may be led to believe by just looking at population average data. So this analysis of calculating mutual information at the single cell level suggests that individual cells actually know quite a lot about what's happening in their environment in contrast to what would be suggested by looking at population average data. So what does this mean uh, in terms of what do I mean when I say cells know what's happening in their environment? So, okay, uh, one can think of an experiment that can allow us to judge whether cells actually know what's happening in their environment is maybe I can take cells and I can expose them to a step input in the ligand concentration. And what, what's that gonna do is gonna, and I can ask whether whenever I change the input concentration, can cells detect when the input concentration was changed? And if they can, then it means that cells actually know what's happening in their environment, right? So here is uh, that experiment. This was done uh, by Laura Hauser's lab at uh, at uh, at the at University of Portland, uh, at University of Oregon. Yes. Uh, just you're running out of time, so maybe you could a couple of minutes or so. Oh yeah, sure. This is this is the last slide. Oh. Okay. Uh, so okay. So yeah, these uh, here I'm showing you uh, the population average response. Uh, when different ligand concentrations were added to these cells. And you can see at the population average level, uh, you can detect what's happening uh, in the environment. Uh, if I look at the population distribution, uh, 
uh, these distributions are quite uh, overlapping with each other. And again, one may let to believe that cells don't know what's happening. But if I look at what's happening in this at single cell level, I see a quite a different picture. So here are uh, different cells uh, in my computational model. Uh, you can see that the, the response distributions at the single cell level are quite separated from each other. And these are, let's say, four different randomly chosen cells in the, in, in the computational model, suggesting that even though the population average responses are overlapping at the single cell level, the responses are quite separated and implying that cells do detect what's happening in their environment. And this is not just true for actually the model, it's also actually true for experimental data. So here are some examples of experimental cells, again, randomly chosen experimental cells. And here too, you see that the responses of individual cells uh, to changes in the extracellular environment are quite separated from each other. This kind of implies that even though population average response may suggest that cells don't know what's happening on them, uh, in their uh, in their environment, if you take into account the variability in cell states, uh, it appears that cells are actually quite good at sensing their environmental, uh, sensing changes in their environment. Uh, so again, individual cells have channels with much higher fidelity. Cells are much better than what is indicated by population or analysis. And a way to think about this is the conditional mutual information. Uh, I can skip over the conclusions and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. So uh, you, there were a couple of questions for you on the chat. Uh, folks, uh, we have time, a little time for questions. So if you have questions, please ask. I'm going to ask uh, John Bichova's question first. Uh, you use point quantities, but you show that the inputs and responses are temporal. Should one consider mutual information between signals UT and XT? Uh, UT and X of T. So, what the as in that would be uh so yes okay so the way the mutual information is constructed you have to define what is an input and you have to define what is an output uh it may be the case that what is a relevant output for the cell is actually uh the entire time course uh, or maybe some function of the time course uh and in that case people have actually shown that if time, instead of a time snapshot, a time course is considered as an output, uh, the mutual information is much higher compared to uh, a time snapshot. Uh, but the, the, the question is not about, the, the, I guess what I'm trying to convey is not about uh, whether, sorry, what I'm trying to convey would hold mm -hmm. even if uh, I'm thinking of a dynamical input and a dynamical output, what I'm talking about is that individual cells response could be quite deterministic if their cell state variables are different. So individual cells may know what is happening both at the level of dynamical output or just static output, uh, even though the population may look like uh, cells are confused. That's the point I was trying to make. Mm -hmm. uh so uh, I had a question, uh, which is that if you, you, you said that some cells, your, your data seems to show that even though individual cells do much better than the population average, there are some cells which are still good in interpreting signals and some cells are bad. Mm -hmm. right? So there is a heterogeneity in cell response. Do you have any thoughts about what determines the response at the tissue level? At the tissue level? So you have actually a collection of cells, right? More, all of yeah, these yeah. are signaling within a tissue. So, so what's going to determine, like, for example, if this is developmental signaling and an entire tissue has to respond? Yeah, so that, that I think there's very good work by, I think, uh, Peter Sorgar, perhaps, a uh, couple of, maybe five years ago. So at the tissue level, if you think about uh, what the tissue may care about, the tissue may perhaps only care about, you know, maintaining fractions of different cell types. And as a result, uh, the 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 information can't as a result that if if mm -hmm. there's a large number of cells present in that tissue and the tissue only cares about you know uh, I want thirty percent of cell type A to seventy percent of cell type B, uh, it's going to do quite well uh, in in interpreting what's happening to the environment. And at the tissue level, I'm sure you can tune 
tissue level properties very finely as a function of the input concentration. But that's almost like a law of large numbers game. Uh, you are better there because you are kind of suppressing noise with a one over square root of n effect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where n is the number of cells that are responding to the signal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. So Aditya had a question. What do you think is the highest capacity the signaling system can transfer the information? Some authors calculated the information flow up to 2.2 bits. Any thoughts on this? I yeah, think so you this, go... yeah. So I, 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 I'll, I'll answer this and I'll probably have to leave. Uh, the This is uh, some, somewhat problematic. The, the, the way channel capacity is calculated has a lot of artifacts. So if I'm considering 10 inputs because somebody, uh, I or somebody else does an experiment where cells were exposed to 10 different inputs, the maximum channel capacity is log of 10. Uh, so the nobody is doing experiments with continuous variation in inputs. Uh, everybody is doing experiments as in it's just humanly not possible to do experiments where inputs are, where you're looking at basically infinitely many inputs. And as a result, the, the cap on these channel capacities are somewhat artificial uh, and that kind of depend on how many inputs you chose in your experiment. So for example, I showed in, a, in the experiment that we have, uh, we had five inputs and our channel capacity was 1.7, but the theoretical cap was something like log of five to the base E, which would be something like 1.8. So even if the cells were completely deterministic, I would not have gone beyond that number. Uh, so what I would say is that one has to be very careful in saying that there's a cap on the mutual information because you have to worry about a lot of experimental artifacts in estimating mutual information. Mm 